Good afternoon, everybody. Just about three o'clock Eastern. Welcome everyone to the second edition of the Marty Grunder Experience. Brought to you as part of the FMC True Champions Program. I'm Mike Sisti, the Marketing Manager for FMC Professional Solutions. And today we're joined by Marty Grunder and Vince Torchia of the Grow Group. Marty's topic today will be finding and keeping the ideal customer. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to mention a special event taking place this year, that being that 2021 uh, marks the 25th anniversary for Talstar Insecticide, uh, manufactured by FMC. And FMC is very proud of this accomplishment to produce a solution for lawn care professionals that they've trusted for years to grow their business for a variety of pests like chinch bugs, ticks, mosquitoes, just to name a few. So as a result, uh, we've launched a sweepstakes earlier this year to help celebrate this uh, with a grand prize of a brand new 2021 Ford F-150 amongst other prizes. Uh, to enter the sweepstakes, take a look at what's on the screen. Please visit talstar25th.com to enroll. The entries are accepted through September 30th of this year. And the winner of the truck will be announced on December 6th during the LM Growth Summit, as Landscape Management's Growth Summit. And for more information about that event, please visit lmgrowthsummit.com. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it over to Vince to uh, kick off today's event. Good, hey, thanks, Mike. Yeah, great, great, very cool thing you're doing with LM and the Growth Summit. Marty's been writing a column for Landscape Management for the last few years, good partner of ours and yours. Mike, I don't know what the limit is on how many times I can put my name in on that drawing, but I'm going to find out what it is and make sure I hit it. So very cool giveaway, very exciting thing to do for the industry. So thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Vince Torchia, Vice President of the Grow Group. I wanted to go through some logistics today for our call-in day. Just so everybody's aware of this, we are recording this session. You will get a copy of this session that we are recording today. So don't feel like you have to write down every note. Don't feel like you will never get to hear this information again. It's going to be recorded and ultimately posted back to True Champion. So um, you'll have an ability to go back through this at your own pace after today as well. Um, if you didn't have a chance to submit a question ahead of time to Marty and I, um, that's okay. We've got an opportunity to take questions today as well. If you have questions as Marty goes through the topic today of finding and keeping your ideal customer, you can use the chat function on Zoom. Put the question in on chat. Um, if there's time, as I mentioned, as we get through the previous call-in questions, we'll be able to take questions live today. So again, if you do have questions, please feel free to throw them into the chat and we'll get to them at the end of Marty's slides. And finally, if you have any regional technical questions, um, don't, don't be afraid to put those in as well. If we cannot help you on a call today, uh, Mike and the team at FMC will get you hooked up with one of your, your local market reps from FMC so that they can help you with a technical question that you have. Um, if this is your first time joining us today for one of these call-in days, um, as Mike said, this is our second installment in partnership with the Grow Group and FMC. Many of you and all of you know who FMC are, but who the Grow Group is. We are a leading green industry consultancy. Um, we are landscape professionals. What we do is provide innovative programming and online training, what you're seeing today. We offer peer groups and one-on-one -on -one coaching. And the biggest thing that we have is real world resources to help owners and their teams succeed. Marty is a real live landscape professional. And if you don't know anything about Marty, uh, Marty actually founded Grunder Landscaping Company as a way to make money for college when he was a teenager, a story that many of you, I'm sure, are intimately familiar with in your own dealings of growing your own businesses. It's amazing, Marty, to see you in yeah. front of your, your Grunder red truck with your brother, Rich, who was probably hired and fired 40 times that summer alone, but uh, what an experience you had hiring your brother and growing your business now in your, your 38th year, which is amazing this summer. Grunder now, Marty, more than 50 team members, more than 50 industry awards. And while it's not on the slide, I can say we got some other cool news recently. Marty was just inducted last week into the Dayton Business Hall of Fame. So Marty, some double congratulations to you from me on that. Very well deserved, a very cool thing that you were honored by, by Dayton and inducted into their Hall of Fame. Um, for those of you that maybe don't know much about Marty or Grunder, um, again, just as we talk about things today, Grunder Landscaping is focused on that high-end residential market. That's really where they make their mark. They are the leading landscaping company in Dayton, Ohio. So while they do lawn care and they are full service, they know what it took to be the biggest company there and then what it's taken to stay in that spot as well. So when we talk about the things that we're going to talk through today, 
It's all in lessons that Marty has learned, things that have worked and not worked coming from Grunder Landscaping Company. We refer to them as our living laboratory. So today, Marty, without further ado, let's share some more with what we can with our attendees today about how they can find and keep their ideal customer. Yeah, thank you so much, Vince. Thank you for uh, reminding me that I won the Hall of Fame award. I'm trying to block that out a little bit because uh, I think it's somewhat... Uh, recognizable that I'm old now uh, if I'm getting inducted into Hall of Fames, but it was flattering nonetheless. And uh, I, I thank you for mentioning that. Thank you so much. You're, you're a heck of a partner. Mike, thank you for all the folks at FMC. We're very excited to be here today. This is where we thrive, where we get to share uh, our knowledge and expertise with all of you. So what we're going to do is I'm going to teach here for a little bit, and then we'll open it up into questions. So, so glad all of you are here. I know we've got folks on from all over the United States and Canada. We're going to talk about finding and keeping uh, the ideal customer. In today's business environment, business is good. I know in the Grow Group, the hundreds of companies that we work with, we're I have an overwhelming amount of them are telling us that business is good. In fact, we're not seeing too many sections of the country where business isn't good. Uh, COVID kind of renewed a focus on landscaping around the residential side. Some of the commercial stuff, yes, we have seen some struggles there. <clears throat> Excuse me, but it looks like some of that is even coming back now because businesses are opening back up. Uh, the problem this year hasn't been finding the work. The problem has been finding the workers. But today we're gonna focus on your ideal client. How do you find them? How do you keep them? How do you, how do you nurture them? Um, all of those things. And so from a foundational perspective, we think it's very important that we share with you where this concept of ideal customer comes from and how you can look and find your own ideal customer. And in the 25 years, over 25 years, that, that the Grow Group has been working with the owners and leaders of landscaping companies, and then in success, successfully running Grunder Landscaping Company, uh, we have come to understand there's three areas that you consider and that you analyze to, to, to be able to have a profile of your ideal client. The first item that you want to look at is profitability. Uh, profitability in a landscaping company, that's your foundation, folks. It's the basis of your whole company's success or failure. It's the ultimate scorecard. If you can't make a profit from a customer directly or indirectly, why are you pursuing that type of client? Why are you keeping them? It's time to get them up to a profitability level that makes the business work or move on. So the first analysis is profitability. And what we recommend contractors do for smaller contractors, maybe it's your 10 to 25 most profitable clients, pull them out. Pull your reports, whatever you're using, whatever software you're using, QuickBooks, whatever, pull out your 10 to 25 most profitable customers, put their names all down on the list and look at them. If you're, if you're a larger company, it could be 50, it could be 100, probably wouldn't go over 100, okay? We're, we're trying to define our ideal client. The second thing we want you to consider is, is the enjoyment of working with them. That's a part of business, folks. Uh, people that you enjoy working with, they give you energy. People that you don't enjoy working with, they take energy from you those unreasonable clients that berate your people that you know are always calling and pushing and asking you for special things. Um, do you like working with this prospect or customer? Is it enjoyable? Do they motivate you to deliver good work? You know, how does that work? Is it an enjoyable experience? And then finally, the word sustainable. Sustainable was not even a word that came up 25 years ago, ladies and gentlemen, when we were talking about landscaping companies. I think today in the, in the American economy, when you hear the word sustainable, I think you go to a, a green component of that. Uh, is it ecologically safe? Is it sound for the environment? Is it a good thing for the environment? So sustainability for the environment, that is an important concept. But for today's purposes, when we're analyzing who our ideal client is, the word sustainable, we want you to think differently than, than the environment with this word. We want you to think like, what can I prop my business up on? Can I make my business work with this type of a customer? Is this the start of a relationship or is it a one-time transaction? Again, at the Grow Group, what we really pushed with companies are, we wanna see you dig 41,000 foot deep wells, not 1,040 foot deep wells. Now, given the nature of lawn care, I understand that it's transactional. So maybe what we would look at would be neighborhoods and density, where we're gonna go into a neighborhood and we're gonna to try to really get density there and go. We're looking for sustainability in this perspective. Can it lead to additional or new accounts? If you lost a key team member, would you lose that account too? How sustainable is that? So again, the analysis of your ideal customer, you look at the customers you have, who are the most profitable ones, which ones do you enjoy working with, 
and which ones are sustainable? Which ones can you grow the business of? That is where we flush out the ideal customer. Now I'm gonna share with you the ideal customer for Grunder Landscaping Company. This does not mean that if your ideal customer is different than this, that you are making a mistake. This is for me, this is unique. This is, this is what each of us have. Your, your traits of your ideal customer may be different and that's fine. What we're trying to get you to do today is prime the pump towards a focus on the ideal customer. Uh, Vince and I and our coaches that we have at the Grow Group, the landscaping companies that we work with, I'm gonna tell you the first thing we do when we go into work with them is, who is your ideal customer? And then once we get that defined and we start talking about marketing and how we're gonna attain more of those, we then start talking about who's our ideal team member. So, you know, I think you could make an argument that no matter what business you're starting, you, your ideal customer is the very first thing you have to consider. Who's gonna pay me for this? What do those people look like? For Grunder Landscaping Company, our ideal client, our ideal customer that you see there on the right side of the screen, those are two photos of jobs of ours that are ideal customers for us, all right? They are high-end residential jobs that we designed and installed, and then we come in with our land keeping uh, department to take care of them and build up that reoccurring revenue because we all know that the reoccurring revenue is where the value and the equity in the business is. High-end residential property owners, they're looking for the highest quality, not the lowest price. It, we, we, most of us know that you cannot offer the best service Hi, everybody. Give us a moment there. I think Marty might have had some technical difficulties. I'm sure he'll be on any second here, but give us a moment and um, Marty will be right back with us to continue on the conversation. So give us a moment here as we sort that out. Marty, welcome back. Well, sorry, guys. I that's mean, okay. That, that's the uh, day and age of technology, huh? <laughs> Marty, we had you right on the GLC ideal client um, PowerPoint. Yeah. If you want to come back from there, we'll get right back into it. I will. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see me now? That looks good. Thank you. You got it. All right. So what I was talking about there before the internet rudely interrupted me was that most 
most companies are not getting paid for travel time. So indirect time. So route density becomes very, very important. We want to work in the neighborhoods that we're working in. They expect professionalism from us and we expect a, uh, we, they expect professionalism from us and we expect them to treat us well in, in return. Our ideal customer makes up those five uh, attributes. As far as what makes up your attributes, it's okay. What I want you to understand here today on, on this glorious day is when you understand what your ultimate value proposition is and who your ideal customers are, you can get a whole lot smarter and a whole lot strategic about finding them and converting them. When we know what we're fishing for per se, we know what bait, rod, and reel to use. If we're going to fish for pompano off the coast of West Palm Beach, Florida, versus uh, trout in a Missouri stream, we know we're going to use a different rod, reel, and bait. And seeking out ideal customers is the same way. So the question becomes, does your, does your ultimate value proposition and your ideal customers, do those align with each other? Is the business set up to serve the ideal customers that you have? In other words, are you selling the right thing to the right people. And, and in some ways this may sound very basic, but Vince and I have found enormous breakthroughs with companies that really get aligned with this and they understand where they make the most money. They understand who their customers are and who they aren't. And finding ideal customers is, is the challenge then. So once we know what we're looking for, we then got to find ways to find them. And we've got some great ways to share with you. None of these are going to be earth shattering to you most likely, but they'll all shed light on some things maybe you're not doing to help move your business forward a little bit. Referrals. Studies show that those who actively seek and use referrals make four to five times more sales. We've made a fortune at Grunder Landscaping Company and with the hundreds of companies that we work with, getting the sales professionals to ask for referrals. It's very simple when you're done and you follow up and you ask if they're happy to say, would you by chance have any friends or family members or neighbors that might also benefit from our products and services? You'll be amazed how many people say, yes, I do. And then you spring into action. You send a note, you call them, you reward the person that referred you. There's all sorts of things we could look at there. 91% of satisfied customers say they give referrals. Yet only 11 sales, 11% 11 of salespeople ask. So there's a disconnect. So we just don't realize that doing something as simple as asking for a referral can generate more business and help us go. It's far better to do something like that than be spending a ton of money on marketing. These are things you should do first before you go into any marketing. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a short bit. Referrals from your existing ideal customers are among the best leads that you're ever going to get. But you, all of you looking at me right now, you got to ask for them. You have to be confident. You have to ask them. That has to be part of your selling strategy. Putting in a regular, repeatable, simple referral plan in place for yourself, even if it's just a line item on a sales checklist that you're going to check off, that's fine. But, but look for the referrals. Other things that we do at Grunder and we've implemented with countless companies across the United States and Canada, target the neighborhoods where your existing ideal customers reside or that share similar demographics as you. Uh, door hangers, when your crews are working there. If you're working at a home or even a business for that matter, there's a pretty good chance that the neighboring home or business also could be a potential client for yours. It just goes without saying. Sending direct mail. I will tell you, and this may be surprising to you, in 2020, our single most effective form of marketing at Grunder and at the companies we work with was direct mail. And I think it had to do with the fact that people were shut down. And so one of the highlights of the day became the mail and people were looking through the mail. We were starved for conversation, for interaction. We were a captive audience. <clears throat> Years ago, the magazines in the seat pocket of airplanes did very, very well. There was a captive audience. You weren't allowed to have your phone on. You were sitting there. There's idle time when, you, when you're going down the runway. There's idle time when you're in the air. There's idle time when you're going to, in for landing, okay? Now you're allowed to keep your phone on. There's other things like that that work very, very well. So being mindful of that and being smart about that makes a difference. So sending welcome to the neighborhood letters to new homeowners, part of a direct mail piece, I think that's something you should look at. We're just telling you that last year, I'm amazed at how effective that was for our customers. Ensuring that your company's trucks display clear branded signage. I don't know that it's necessarily critical that you put your website or your phone number on your trucks, although I think it's a decent idea. What's very important is that your trucks are branded and lettered on all four sides. 
You may want to put a QR code if that's something you want to try, but having the branding there, they ought to be able to go right in your neighborhood and Google your name and pull it up right there on your phone. Your website should be mobily enabled to handle all that, meaning that whatever device they're pulling up your website on, it doesn't load slow or anything else. Those are one of the ways you can compete with the big guys, folks, by having a website that is enabled to do that. Asking to, to display a small company sign at a completed job site. We have a client in New York whose office is right next door to a Dunkin' Donuts that is, it's one of the most busiest Dunkin' Donuts I've ever seen in my life. And they have a contract with the Dunkin' Donuts, they landscaped it, and then they have these signs in the drive through prompting them to say, listen, if we can help you, call us. They say it brings them in tons of business. That's one particular angle of it. But I think a job site sign in front of your, your properties that has been well-maintained and, and is a good reflection on you, what a beautiful calling card that is. And that's simple old school marketing that still works. Getting involved in the community. I think there's three things when we talk about getting involved in the community. Schools. Schools can get a tad political, but for the most part, they're not. And getting involved in schools where you're speaking at the school, or maybe you're doing a sensory garden, or you're, you're tending to a garden, or you're teaching the kids how to grow vegetables, that could be good for your business in terms of recruiting new people. That also can be good for your business in terms of the parents that send their children there. Anything you can do with the arts tends to be a, an exceptional way to market and find other ideal customers because high uh, net worth individuals tend to be involved in the arts. Sophisticated people tend to be involved in the arts. And when I mean sophisticated, sophisticated people that might also consider their landscape a piece of art, all right? And then the last thing that we wanna tell you is probably the best one I have to share with you. The Humane Society, any type of pet adoption things in your, in your local uh, area, get involved with that. It's not political. Dogs, it's rare to find someone that doesn't like a dog, all right? Cats, all that stuff, the Humane Society, great place to get involved in the community. In. And then of course, giving back. And there's various ways you can give back. Normally there's something that the owner of a landscaping company, the owner of a lawn care company can find in the community that they enjoy that also gives back to the community. Connecting on social media with your customers, running targeted ads on Facebook and Instagram, those all tend to be very smart ways to find other ideal clients for your company. A uh, couple other ideas that we've done that have been effective, believe it or not, we're given the whole gamut here, pool permit records. <laughs> we have had some success by pulling the records of pools built in the last 10 to 20 years and then direct mailing those people with pictures of pool rehab jobs or new pool, pools that we have installed. Generally speaking, a pool is indicative of somebody with some net worth that can do something and an in-ground in -ground pool specifically tends to indicate an investment in the property and the pool or the areas around it may need replacing. Or maybe it started out with a pool for young children, now it's teenagers, you may be able to add a fire pit, there may be something else, but this may be something to do. And then the other one I wanna suggest, and this one is obvious and it is not easy, okay? It requires hard work. It requires you getting on the phone. It requires you being intentional, so on and so forth, but reconnect with past prospecting customers. Always leave the door open, ladies and gentlemen, for the possibility of future work. A no, at least a no last year, may be a yes next year. And I cannot tell you how many times you've had somebody tell us no and just by us following up and saying, hey, Mrs. McGillicuddy, Marty Grunder, Grunder Landscaping Company, do you have a minute? Sure, Marty, say, I'm really sorry we didn't get to work with you last year, but I was going back through this and I wondered if there would be any merit in me coming over and talking to you or walking around your property with you. Gosh, we'd sure love to work with you. You'd be amazed at how many people tell you yes to that scenario. In this environment, where it's very hard to find a contractor in the first place, if you prime the pump a little bit by doing a little outreach, you might be surprised by what you find out. So I hope in a small way we helped you there in terms of finding some ways to find your ideal uh, customers. And Vince, I'm going to turn it over to you. I understand we've got some good questions that maybe we can carry on the discussion with. We do, Marty. Thanks for taking us through that. Mike, I know we've got some questions. We'll let you moderate, so take it away. We do, yes. So as we continue our conversation here, our first question is from Scott in Mississippi. Uh, what are some of the best questions you can ask to determine if someone is in fact uh, an ideal customer for you? You know, Mike, that's a great question. So at Grunder Landscaping Company with our industry specific software that we use, it's called Aspire, whatever, whatever they may use, Real Green, LMN, whatever it is, 
there's a field there and there's a series of questions when we're screening someone. Uh, and this is for a phone screening. Now we do get a lot of leads off the web. So there's a questionnaire that they have to fill out. So I guess my answer would be twofold. You can put the same questions that I'm about ready to share with you as part of your inquiry if they're, if they're going in through the web inbox or if they're on the phone. And some of the questions we ask are obviously their address, all right? We wanna make sure, are they in an area that we can serve? We see so many contractors wasting time going on leads that are outside of the area that they can satisfactorily service and make a dollar. So obviously finding out where they are but in-depth questions like, tell me the process you're going to go through in selecting a contractor. If this is a bigger job, you obviously want to know that. If they say, well, I found you off Google and I'm going to get 27 bids, probably not a great lead. It's probably not trending in the right direction. If it's lawn care and you're screening someone, tell me what's important to you in, in your lawn care provider. You want to be looking for buzzwords that tie into some of your ideal attributes. So for us, when we're screening someone and we say, tell us about the process you're going to go through in selecting a contractor, for our ideal clients, where, where we think this has got a shot to be a, a good relationship for us, well, we've seen your work at Mrs. Jones' house over here on Highland Terrace, and we think it's terrific. We know you're not cheap, but we know you're good, and we want to talk to you. That would categ categorize as a ding, 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 ding. I, I like the sounds of that. Let's go have a conversation. Other things you want to ask, it, it really pertains to what you're looking for in an ideal customer. If it's location, and that's a big driving part of your route density, then it's got to be about location. Um, maybe, maybe you ask a question such as, how many professional lawn care companies have you worked with in the last five years? If they tell you 70 or seven, the next question is, did you, what kind of difficulties did you encounter? Oh, well, everyone I hire, they're all, they kill my yard. They, they burn it out. They blame it on watering or a dull mower blade. You know, when I start hearing stuff like that, I get, I get concerned. It's not to say that we can't educate them on our process or that we're different, but those are some things that maybe would help um, Scott in Mississippi determine who his ideal customer. Everyone is unique there, Mike, because it all makes up the profile of what your ideal customer. That's why it's so important for everyone listening to take some time and to take action on those three areas that we talked about, the profitability, the enjoyment, and the sustainability. And in that enjoyment is, I wanna work with people that, that value a green lawn. I don't want them just to be treating lawn care as a to-do list item, that they just gotta get it done. I want them to say, I want the greenest lawn on the street. I don't want any chinch bugs. I don't want any fire ants, you know, so on and so forth. So those would be some things that maybe will help Scott. Great. Our next question comes from Don in, in Dallas. And he asks, what are some of the ways to determine what marketing you should invest in in order to reach your ideal customer? That's a great question. Um, and we could go on for hours about that. Anytime I'm going to do a marketing campaign at Grunder, or when we're going to recommend one for one of our clients, we always try to start out with something that we know we can measure. I just think that's important. Um, the direct mail piece that we talked about, some of that stuff is so controlled. You can use every uh, door direct program with the U.S. Post Office. You can literally go through streets and pick who you want to mail. Um, I'm not real big on having some marketing company do a $20,000 marketing campaign for me I'm going to do a small one and see what happens. I'm going to, I'm going to see what I find out. Uh, I think the other thing to consider when you're talking about which ways you should market to invest in your ideal client, you, you got to think about what's the marketing going to cost and what's the return on the jobs that I'm selling. Um, you know, if, if you want to market aeration, for example, to your ideal customers and you're going to blanket, you know, trying to attain new customers that way, that may or may not make sense. I think it's important that it's measurable. I think it's important that you try to find things that make sense to sell the kind of work that you want to sell. Vince, did you have anything that we've worked with our clients that might help there? Yeah, I'd say that, Marty, to your point, number one, for any marketing that we're going to start off, especially if it's our first foray into it, as you said, we've got to find a way to measure it and measure success against it. Whether it's digital marketing, print marketing, whatever the case may be, we've got to have a way that we can look back and say, 
okay, whether it's good or bad, this worked 30% of the time. So next time we do something, we have something to measure it against, right? So having some data to pull from. And then Marty, something I've learned from you is that depending on who your ideal client is, whether it is high end, whether it is transactional, whether it's volume, whatever that looks like for you, look at the people that are tangential to your product offering and see what kind of marketing they are doing. For example, right. a friend of landscaping company, Marty, you develop relationships with people at the Lexus dealership or the Infinity dealership, right? Because they sell to the customer that you also sell to. So if Lexus is sponsoring the local golf outing because Lexus, this big company already knows that's where wealthy people in Dayton, Ohio are going, and we want to sell lawn care to wealthy people, maybe that golf tournament is the place that we should be, right? Conversely, if we find out that at Walmart, we can have the front of the cart, right? Have our logo on it because we're a volume transactional company, then that would be a place we want to go to. So look at other companies in your market area that serve your ideal client and find out what they're doing for marketing. That's another That's good That's an thing. excellent point, Vince, an excellent point. And then the last thing I would mention there in terms of ideal customer there's some basic things that you ought to have. You know, I ought to be able to go to your website and instantly be able to relate. Like it ought to be screaming at me that, that you're a fit for me. So you have to try to do things in the narrative or the perspective of that ideal client, ideal customer, and go from there. Excellent point, Vince. Great. Our next question comes from Jose at 123, located in Miami. Once you find your ideal customer, what is the best way to manage their expectations? Yeah, one, two, three. What a cool name. I've, I've seen that company. I, I always chuckle when I see that. That has to bring them a lot of business and I would think a lot of conversations, which I, 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 think, it's, I think it's cool. Mm -hmm. um, managing expectations is a challenge. I, and I'll give you some of the things that we teach our sales professionals at Grunder to do and what we teach when we do our sales boot camps, Mike. Um, you got to be crystal clear about expectations. In fact, you got to go so far as to follow up discussions with emails. Make sure your contracts clearly lay out what you're going to do. When you hear a customer or a potential customer saying something that's making, I always say, making your feet sweat. My feet sweat when you're going to tell me something that I don't like. And, and I'm like, oh, God, I, I have to address that. Now, Mike, when I was 28 or closer to Vince's age, I wasn't near as good at telling people no as I am now. And what I have come to realize is that when you say yes to something and you're kind of concerned that you're going to be able to deliver on that, that comes back at you in such a negative way later. Uh, it's not even funny. So I think it's very important that you, for lack of a better word, hammer home what you can do and what you can't do. Um, we had a customer that, that was adamant that the spots in his backyard were our doings with the fertilizer and he had four dogs. It was not the fertilizer, it was the four dogs. And I finally said, listen, I'm sorry, you're wrong. And I'm going to take a soil test of this. And I'm telling you, it's gonna come back for a high concentration of dog urine. There's no way it's anything that we're doing. That was a very difficult conversation to have with him but there is science involved in most of the work that we do. And there's also limitations. I mean, one, two, three, you've got limitations on what you can do with a tree and what you can't and what you can do with lawn care and what you can't. So I think it, what it, what the challenge becomes is role playing with all of your people so that they can figure out the nicest way possible to deliver bad news. Mm -hmm. um, you just have to be blunt with that stuff because not meeting expectations that Jose talks about, he's right on to be concerned about that. And Vince, we see a lot of these younger men and women that are running companies, they call us with just crazy customers that they've gotten themselves involved with. And we can't help but wonder, could we have helped them avoid that with a little better dialogue up front? Vince? Yeah, I'd say, Marty, to your point with Jose's question, it's all, all done on the front end, right? If we got to front load all those expectations and making sure that they are truly an ideal client for us and that we've taken them through our steps. And as you said, documenting things you've talked about. Hey, Mr. Jones, I just wanted to follow up with an email of the things that we just talked about on the phone, right? Putting that stuff in writing, making sure there's history of it. All of that goes a very long way in setting expectations. So Marty, the only thing I wanted to add was that is that what else can we do on the front end as part of our process 
not like, oh yeah, I got to remember to ask these questions, but no, it's the way that we do business on the front end to make sure that clients understand how we do things. Marty, I love to joke with people that in our industry, for whatever case may be, someone might say, you know, hey, for this lawn care, you know, I'll pay you once a quarter or I'll pay at the end of the year for everything you've done. Pick up your phone and call AT&T and try to tell them you want to pay them in December for everything that happened this year. Or pick up your phone and call AT&T and say, hey, I didn't really use my phone that much this month. So I know I've got a monthly contract with you, but can you lessen it? Because I, I only made 10 phone calls. Usually I make 50. Or I, I, didn't, I didn't drive my Honda for three months. Can I not pay the payment on it? <laughs> right. So again, our industry has got to, to your point, Marty, kind of grow in that professional way to say, no, this is how we do business. If we're not a fit for you, that's fine. We're not going to make exceptions. Yeah, Vince, you make me think of another point. Leverage is with the contractor right now in this business environment. So try some of this stuff. Um, you know, role play with your team and pretend like you're talking to your mother or your grandmother or the aunt that you really like them as a person, but you got to tell them something that they may not like or agree with. You just, you know, the best doctors aren't aren't the ones that tell you what you want to hear. They tell you what you need to hear. And I, I think a mentality like that for business is needed. Yep. Great question. Yep. And, and Marty, to your point too, about having that difficult conversation around the science of the, of the turf with the, with the soil test, Great point, but you know another example of that of how to have that difficult conversation is bring in that third-party data. I mean, through there the FMC go. True Champions program, some of that information is there, but there's also, and that now you're hearing that from a from a PhD or from your local cooperative extension, and it's just the facts, and you're simply you know what you just facts. you just made me think that's that's what I should have done with that. I should have said, do you mind if we get a soil test so we can find out. I kind of got cocky with it because I was getting upset. He was laying into our, our team and, and I finally said, no, and then soil test came back. I was right and we got through it, but it was a conversation that my professional was having trouble talking to the customer. The owner had to come in to say, listen, time out. There's some science here we got to look at. Yep. So excellent point, Mike. Yep. Yeah, I just learned, thank you. Sure. And also Richard in Miami, what type of follow-up process should we put in place for our ideal customers? You know, if they're an ideal customer and they are profitable, they're enjoyable, and you can build your business off them, those are the ones you got to have a follow-up process where you're reaching out. Um, and, you know, you almost want to, might want to put them in a grid and, and have a touch on them. Call them, hey, Marty Grunder, you know, checking in with you, wanted to make sure everything's okay. Um, I wanted to see if maybe I could come walk around with you. It depends on the size of the job. I know at our company, we consider our 200 landkeeping accounts those are our cream of the crop customers. And we have a touch point on them where the salesperson is required to make a visit to their home. They handwrite a note. We invite them to an annual event that we do at the art center. And then they get a couple gifts throughout the year. This past year, they got an umbrella. This fall, they'll get free mums. We'll, we'll stick some mums in around their mailbox or we'll deliver them a potted plant. Depends on what we decide to do there. But, you know, I, I think you've got to kind of come up with you know, this is, we're trying to get those customers, if you can see me, sealed in this little ball with no opportunity, hopefully, I shouldn't say opportunity, with no inkling or encouragement to look someplace else because we're doing such a great job. Um, and we try to close the loop on that. We let them know that we appreciate them. And it's not just by our words and our gifts, it's also by our actions. When a storm comes through Dayton, Ohio for one of those 200 accounts that we have, we will be proactive with an email. We will tell them that we have our tree companies on standby. If there's any issues, we're going to be out to take care of them. Um, we just try to treat them the way that, you know, a VIP at a particular place would want to be treated. Um, the club where I play golf, it's, it's a nice place. But what I really like about them is, is how they treat me. Um, and they make me feel like I'm important. And I think if we can figure out some ways to do that as green industry professionals, it's really not that hard to do it. It could be a note, it could be a phone call, it could be a simple act of kindness, a free snow plowing in the winter, a free cleanup, you know, and, and for southerly states. Vince, what are some other things maybe come to mind with you there on the ideal customer? I think, Marty, the most important thing you said for everyone to take away is it's, again, it's part of a system. It's not just, oh, I haven't called Marty Grunder in a year. I better just call him out of the blue and talk to him. You know what I mean? So you've got quarterly, we're going to send them a handwritten note. Q2, they're going to get a uh, gift from us. Q3, they're going to get an invitation to 
uh, the Dayton Arts Center for a show that we're going to buy them free tickets to Q4 Christmas. Uh, they're going to get a Christmas card from us and a bottle of wine if they're a certain level client, right? But that's not just up to chance. It's, hey, we've got our quarterly plan. Maybe the quarterly plan is for half of your clients. Maybe there's even a more subsect Marty VIP set that you're thinking, man, I better find two times to take this person out for dinner or out to play golf in the next right. year, right? But it's, it's part of the system that you have. So whatever it is, don't overthink it. Don't make it too complicated. Start with a handwritten note as a thank you and start with sending them some coffee or some wine, whatever you feel is appropriate at, at two points in the year. And that will cover you, right? So you can always build from that, but don't overthink it, put into a system and just get started. And you know, Vince, this is why I like having you here. You made me think of something else. Um, you got to be organized, put it in your calendar. One of our largest clients that we uh, added to the stable about 10 years ago, I remember when we were courting him, and we went over there and the first thing he said was, wow, Marty, you came over. I said, well, yeah, I came over. He said, you know, so-and-so, I never even saw so-and-so in my yard in the 15 years they worked here. Never saw him. So you're already beating him by one. Well, guess what I've made, made it a point to do? I'm in his yard and I text him, hey, John, I'm going to be walking around your yard. Just want you to know. Sometimes I'm eating my lunch out in front of his house. I mean, I just put on my calendar. Pretty easy way to take an hour to go over there once a quarter, Vince and Mike, and, and hopefully further cement that relationship we have with that customer. I don't think I've said this yet today, but it's, it's something we talk about ad nauseum. People do business with people they know, like, and trust. Mm -hmm. And that's a process. Yep. And that requires being intentional and organized more than anything else when we're talking about people that are already doing business with us. It's just not that hard to put it out in your calendar. And like you said, uh, be intentional about it and get it on the calendar and just go get it done. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we've got a few questions now about customers who have worn out their welcome. Um, <laughs> Marty, so what's your take on firing a difficult customer that you find out really isn't your ideal customer after all? So I, I, what, what goes on here at the FMC program stays at the FMC program. <laughs> um, I have five voicemails saved on my server of the firing of customers um, that, that I secretly recorded. They were all for using bad language towards my team and or making just ridiculous comments. Um, we had a customer that I fired three years ago that said to our team, she was tired of paying Harvard prices for community college employees. She said that to them. Um, it was, so off, it was so off base and so outrageous. And that gets into that second point that we talked about in the categorization of your ideal client. Are they enjoyable? Sometimes you have to tell people that you can't work with them anymore. I don't raise my voice. I try to go see them in person if it's a pricing issue. But when someone has berated my people or worn them out, um, I have done those on the phone. Seth, our COO, went and told one last week that we weren't going to work for him anymore because they're their comments and their insults on the emails had just gotten to the point where it just, it wasn't right for us to have anybody in our company serving them. Very small percentage, okay? Mm -hmm. So we gotta be very careful that we don't wallow in all that mud and that misery of, we've got one we fired this year, we had none last year, we had one the year, I mean, it's a very small percentage. Now, customers that we can't keep working with, that we enjoy working with them, that it's sustainable, but the pricing isn't right, and they can't come up to a level that we can afford to work with them anymore. Those I make personal visits. Those I might bring some flowers to give to give them. I'll certainly follow it up with a handwritten note thanking them for listening to me. And I'll give them another company to refer that might be able to help them. Those are some ways that we've done that. Vince, I don't know if I'm overlooking some other methods that we've used to coach or at Grunder that maybe you're aware of. Yeah, Marty, I think the one thing that, and you started to hit on this, is important for everyone to hear is that um, no matter how unreasonable a client is or no matter how off base you think they are, you've agreed to this with them, right? So you've got to look in the mirror a little bit and make sure that right. we're not ignoring everything they're saying because we're upset with them, right? So if there is some kernels and truth of what they're upset with you on, you've got to own that as a business professional and say, okay, well, what can I do going forward to get better? But Marty, your, your point too, just, you know, a lot of us work in, whether it's small towns or big towns, there's no sense in burning any bridges, right? right. So if you're going to end work that you're going to do with someone, end it professionally, try to give them a referral, 
right? That maybe can meet their expectations in a way that you can't. You don't know who their cousin, brother, sister, boss, friend is. And we don't need people talking about how horrible that Marty Grunder is for firing me. They want to say, oh, we use Grunder and, you know, they seem to do different work than we wanted. And he referred us to somebody else and it turned out fine, right? I think people will be okay with that, Marty, if they heard that. So let them down in a nice way. Try to keep the bridge stable if you can. And I, Marty, as you said, giving them a problem to their solution ultimately is a good thing to do. So all good points. Be classy. Even those ones that got rid of us for foul language, I wrote them a thank you note. And yep. I still tried to tried to stay classy. Yep. Uh, it just you have you have to back your people up if it's getting into that kind of behavior. And the other ones, like Vince said, when it's not profitable, be classy, be yep. be professional about it. It'll probably come back at you in a good way, one way or the other later. So along the same lines, you know, the next question is how can you get a customer to change their perspective when they're upset with you and you're trying to earn their trust back? Well. This happens, you know, the number of transactions that we conduct on an annual basis at Grunder, this does happen a couple times a month. It does. Um, and some people, they may be exaggerating the problem because work was bad or they've been traveling a bunch or they've got COVID fatigue or whatever. So the number one suggestion I have is always try to meet them in person if you can. Now, I understand given the nature of, of the business, that's not always possible. But my number one piece of advice is to go meet them in person if possible. And if you're try to strip the emotion out of it and just look at the facts, if you're upset with what was done or if that was your home or your office or your property and you would be upset, I would show a lot of empathy. And I try to diffuse it by saying, Mrs. Jones, I'm over here to see you in person. And to be blunt, I'm embarrassed and I'm sorry. And our company has a 38 year history of making things right. We're going to make this right. So I want to talk to you about what your expectations are and how I can make this right. Can you please talk with me? We're going to get this right. Trust me. And then you got to spring into action and make it right. I never really liked the language. It's a cost to doing business. But in this instance, it is. And when you understand, especially with the internet, the power that somebody has with these things right here, You've got to make that stuff right. Um, <clears throat> and you just, you know, for lack of a better word, you have to eat it and you have to go in there. And I think when someone sees you in person, <clears throat> excuse me, and you, you show genuine empathy and you lay out what you're going to do, and then by God, you better go do what you said you were going to do. A lot of times those issues can turn that relationship to another level where people do business with people they know, like, and trust. They made a mistake. Marty came and saw me in person. He had it rectified the next day. He followed up two weeks later. And then he sent me a handwritten note thanking me for my patience and understanding. That guy is A-OK -okay in my book because we all know there's gonna be problems, right? It's how they handle them that makes a difference. Marty, I think something to add to that too that you do really well is you never throw anyone else from the team under the bus. No. Never go out and say, oh, Mrs. Jones, I'm so sorry. Vince is my guy on this and he completely screwed it up. I don't know what he was thinking. I can't believe he did this to you. I'm going to make this right. You, you never do that. You say, no. render landscaping, right? We, we're going to make this right. We're not, we, we're not going to do that to our people, whether they deserve it or they don't, it doesn't get us anywhere, Marty. You do that really well. I wanted to mention that as well. I think that's a lesson in teamwork. Um, Vince was a tremendous high school athlete. I was not. I had kids that were tremendous high school athletes. And, and one of the things that, that they got out of that, one of my daughters played a, at a high level uh, sport in college, there's that teamwork. And you just don't do that to people. Everyone's going to have a bad day. Mm -hmm. And you would hope that there's reciprocation there amongst your team, that they don't throw me under the bus towards our clients either. So, you know, Vince, you make an excellent point. And I, I think that's something that becomes part of your culture that it's known Marty isn't going to throw you under the bus. If anything, he's going to back you up. He'll tell them it's his fault. And I don't think people want to hear whose fault it is. People want to hear about the solution. Yeah, exactly. So Marty, our next question comes from Sue from MJ Designs. And she's wondering how to best understand which customers to professionally stop service on. Is there a grading scale to follow or can you add any comments or thoughts to that? 
Yeah, Vince, you want to take them through the ABC scaling thing that we do? That that might help them. And I know you were just doing that with one of our clients. No, that's exactly right. So good question from Sue. But so what we do is we, we list out all of our clients, right? No matter how many accounts that you're servicing and they get an A, B, or a C rating. A means we're happy with them. They're paying. There's more work to do. This is a client we want to continue to do more work with. B clients, things are going well. We're not sure how much more work we can do with them. We're not sure the total value of their account, but things are going well with this client so far. We'll give them a B. And a C is they're not likely to invest any more in the property. They're not really a good fit for us right now. And we don't know if we should continue to work with them anymore, right? So just a very quick rating, A, B, or C. So if we go through all those, then you can make determinations on the goal is really trying to move those C's to a B if possible, or as Marty said, professionally getting rid of those C's, making them not a, not a part of your portfolio anymore, moving the B's to an A and keeping them from becoming a C, and then keeping the A's at an A and finding more A clients that they might know. So Sue, in a very quick exercise, Grunder tries to do it at least once a year, go through all the accounts, give them that A, B, or C rating, and again, have realistic expectations about how you can get as many of those up to A as possible, move the C's to a B if you can, and then how you're going to professionally move the C's out of your portfolio. And it actually can be a really good exercise to do with your team. And the reason it's a good exercise is, so you're further teaching your team who your ideal customer is by doing this. And so hopefully in their salesmanship and other things that you're doing, this is starting to make a lot of sense who we work with and who we don't, what works well with us, what doesn't. But what Vince just described is exactly what we do. You can have some deviation of that, but that in the, it is the gist of us trying to figure out where we're at. Perfect. Okay, shifting gears a little bit here. We've got a couple more questions left that have been submitted. Marty, Jeff in Texas is wondering, what's a tactful way to ask a customer on how to leave a review for your company? I think the best way to do it, so when you get an invoice from us, we have an electronic bill and it has right on there when you make a payment, it says, would you be uh, comfortable recommending us doing a review on us? And there's a link that they can do that to. I think that's one way. I think another way, and I'm not trying to be funny, Mike, ask. Mm -hmm. and, and you just tell them, you just, you're just blunt with them and you just say, Mrs. Jones, I'm working really hard to grow my business. I'm really glad that you're happy. I was wondering if you would be willing to help me by doing a review. And if you do a review, I'll make a donation to the Humane Society or, or something like that. Those reviews are golden. You know, I have said for over 30 years from the podium speaking, what other people say about you is infinitely more impressive and convincing than what you say about yourself. When I go on someone's website and it's got all these blind testimonials, I don't believe them. All right. There's even been articles I've read in the Wall Street Journal about fictitious reviews on Amazon. But when I when I see a review that says Grunder Landscaping Company is the finest service company I've ever done business with. Sincerely, Vince Torchia, Blue Ash, Ohio. That's legit. That that kind of stuff is good. So I would try to prime the pump a little bit with links on your invoices. And then I would ask. And if you want to, you could do a separate email campaign because electronic reviews are, you know, those are, those are pretty easy. That's what we're trying to grab a hold of. And maybe you say that for everyone we get, we'll make a donation. I, that, that would be some ideas I would have. Vince, anything else that you know that we've come across? Jeff, number one, you got to make it aware to everyone in your company that that's what you want to do so that people have their ears up. Because Jeff, I'm sure like many of us, you get a lot of communication from email. And sometimes a client will email you something nice right in an email. You've got to have it in your head to say, hey, Mr. Jones, thank you for saying that about us. Do you mind if we use, in quotes, what they said as a review? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying we should do this all the time, but I've had conversations with people over the phone and I've emailed them a little bit of a synopsis of what they've said and said, hey, Adam, do you mind if we use this as a testimonial? And I wrote it for them. And if they're happy, they're going to say, sure, I don't care. So don't be afraid to push it a little bit and say, hey, I wrote this based on our conversation. Do you mind if we put this on our website or do you mind if we use this on Google? So again, to Marty's point, we got to ask, but then everyone on our team has got to have their filter set because we're all moving so quick. You hear the compliment and then you don't take the time to capture it and actually implement it somewhere. And so those, those, those are one of those things, Vince and Mike, they're golden for selling. You know, we, we, we drop money like this on, you know, having a marketing firm help us with things. 
there's probably, we could probably come up with 10 things you ought to be doing that don't cost a lot of money. They take time that will make an impact on your business. I mean, going to your page and seeing all those reviews that are overwhelming of people that are like the folks looking for the work. I mean, what a great thing to have, my goodness. <laughs> and Marty, finally, if I, if I summarize these last series of questions here, we have several questions asking your opinion on how do you approach, sell, and speak to you know, residential customers versus commercial customers? So, you know, I have long felt, there's a lot of things I felt that I was very fortunate to, to have happen to me. First of all, I'm really glad my parents named me Marty because Marty is an easy name to pronounce. It's memorable, but you don't really know a lot of Martys. I mean, I know a couple, I don't know a bunch. One of the other things I feel grateful for is the fact that in the landscaping business, Mike, and Vince, you know what I'm gonna say, you can drive by a property and if the property looks good, hip, hip, hooray. We know somebody there cares about landscaping. They might listen to me and I can cold call them. If we drive by a property and it doesn't look good, hip, hip, hooray. Maybe they haven't had a good enough landscaper call on them yet. I can go call on them. So really, again, and, and as we kind of review the last hour that we've been together, most of this has to do with being intentional. And most of this has to do with uh, taking action on things. Is it easy to do cold calls? Is it easy to do door hangers? Is it easy to knock on doors? Is it easy at the end of a day when you just had a sales call at Mike Sisti's house and you're walking down the driveway and the neighbor's walking up? Is it easy to wave and say, hey, can I just say hello to you for a second? I'm Marty Grunder, Grunder Landscaping Company. We're doing a lot of work for Mike's family. Here's my card. If you see something you don't like or there's a pile of dirt or anything, call me. And if there's anything I could ever do for you, would you let me know? And then leave. Those, that's laying the groundwork for the future. Cold calls on commercial. I've got our sales team out doing that right now, looking for snow, snow contracts. And we are knocking on doors. And once you start doing it and you get used to it, first of all, you have to overcome no, because it's hard with COVID. There's people aren't letting you in their buildings. Some of it's hard, but this stuff, it works. And it really comes down to percentages. So you start tracking what your percentage close on that. And you know, if you need $2 million worth of new business, or you need $200,000 worth of new business, and you know you close at a 20% rate, if we need $200,000 worth of new business, Vince, how much work do we have to quote? A million, a million bucks. <laughs> a million bucks. So there's a math side of it. And I think just good old fashioned hustle. And I'll tell you, Mike, and I feel very strongly about this. It is very hard to find a contractor right now. They are all busy. So if you do some outbound calls, either on the phone or in person, and you prime that pump, there may arguably never be a better time in business history that I can think of to do that. Now, you've got to have the capacity to be able to deliver on what you're going to sell. Mm -hmm. But I think I, the best thing I have to share with that is old fashioned hustle. And I think Mike and Marty, too, just as we're wrapping it up here again, and you got to think about who you're selling to from a residential side, right? We're going to talk about emotions and we're going to talk about family. And we're going to talk about pe people enjoying their space, right? We might talk about that on a commercial property, but guess what else they care about? Dollars and cents. Here's what it's going to cost. I'm not going to miss days. I'm going to show up. What's your bid? Maybe I can beat it, right? So you got to understand, you got to meet them at the place where they want to be bought from. Yep. And I think also to add to that, Vince, you know, if there's a neighborhood that is like a bullseye for you, um, there's a neighborhood close to our shop. There's 144 homes. We have 21 of them. We continue to hit them. We're targeting them on Facebook ads. We're hitting them with postcards. We're putting the job site signs up there. We're driving trucks slowly through the neighborhood on Saturdays, okay? We're doing whatever we can do there, and we're continuing to try to get in front of them to make a difference. Um, you know, hopefully we help some folks uh, but I, I think good old fashioned hustle is the best answer for that. Mm -hmm. yep. Absolutely. Good, Marty. Well, we are right on time. Mike, if you got anything else to close up, I'll take us through here. That's great. I do have one point I wanted to circle back real quickly because it speaks to a little bit of what uh, we're doing with the FMC True Champions program. Marty mentioned earlier about uh, getting involved in the community and all those local ideas are, are, are phenomenal. I completely agree with that. One of, the other, um, one of the other pillars of the FMC True Champions program is our industry commitment. And one of the groups that FMC and, and, the, and those involved with FMC have been behind for a number of years is Project Evergreen. And Project Evergreen is a national 
uh, nonprofit organization that promotes the benefits of what we do in the lawn and the lawn and landscape industry, uh, promoting that green matters, showing the uh, the cooling effects, the environmental effects of lawn care and tree care and the, and the like. And they've done a number of revitalizations all throughout the country from Detroit to New York to Arizona to Texas, on and on and on, and utilizing lawn care companies to help do what they do best and go out there and put their work to use to promote those benefits. So that piece of it, as well as the other one that they do, which is called Green Care for Troops, essentially it's providing your lawn and landscape services for someone that's serving overseas. Uh, for cert for and they will do a matching process for you to connect you with that a great way to give back to the industry you could take a look at projectevergreen.org to get all the details about that but a great way to get involved and give back and they basically do all the work to coordinate that for you you basically just just have to show up hmm. what a great program yeah Mike, thank you. Marty, thank you. As a reminder, just as we're signing off here, don't forget tallstar25th.com will be announced at the LM Growth Summit um, at the end of this year. Mike, thanks for setting up for everybody on that. Enter the drawing. What a very cool opportunity. Very cool thing. As you said, Mike, very proud to be a part of what we're doing here with FMC and the Grow Group. And Marty, uh, we got another call-in day in September, September 15th, 3 to 4 o'clock Eastern time. Um, you will get a copy of this. Do not worry. Everything we talked about and more, you'll get a copy of. And uh, we hope to see you all in September. So on behalf of FMC and the Grow Group, Mike and Marty, thank you. Everybody have a great rest of your Wednesday.